is Arno. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the education coordinator here at the BGC, and I'm with my guest, Justin. Justin, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Hello, uh, my name's Justin Dale. I'm a Calgary-born uh, circus performer, and uh, I, uh, I've been doing circus and uh, show business um, for about almost 15 years now. So it's been, uh, it's been a long time and I've seen a lot of stuff. So I'm, I'm super happy for this opportunity to maybe shine some light. And uh, if you're interested in show business, in particular circus, um, I'd be super happy to get you into that. We need more people. <laughs> and uh, so you said you were in circus. Why did you originally get into this career? Uh, I started as a martial artist. So from the time that I was about eight years old, um to actually currently i still study martial arts but uh my my father was a martial artist and it was sort of a family thing so uh i i was it was into um physical performance in a way because you have to uh you have to recite your movements and it's all very technical and stuff but it wasn't artistic in the way that uh, uh circus or dance or theater could could have been so i was used to training and being um uh, diligent with my body and everything like that but uh, once I started uh, in sort of in middle school, high school, um, there was a conservatory called Summerstock Conservatory. And uh, I started doing musical theater, acting, singing, dancing, that kind of thing, and being on stage and uh, still having to hit tight cues and do choreography and all of that stuff. So that was really fun. And that really hit it for me. I was like, I want to do performing arts, but I don't want to do just theater and I don't want to do just singing or anything. I want the extreme stuff. So I started doing stunts and uh fight choreography, getting kicked off stairs, stuff like that. And I found extreme performance to be immensely satisfying, both for the adrenaline and the challenge and the, 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 the response from the audience has been terrific. So um, I started delving into it and getting into like fire juggling and uh, um, unicycling, extreme performance, that kind of stuff. And uh, then I, I, uh, I ended up meeting somebody who had uh, like a circus background and I'd never seen circus like Cirque du Soleil style circus before. So in high school, I met this girl and she was doing handstands and contortion and stuff. And I was like, whoa, that's pretty neat. And it turns out you can go to school um, and get a degree in circus uh, here in Canada at the National Circus School. So I went and did that um, from 2011 to 2014 and trained with some really excellent people. We can talk more about that in a minute. But uh, yeah, I basically got on this track to realize that actually, if you want to do extreme performance for a career, it's totally possible you can make a good living at it and uh, travel, see the world. And that's that's that. That's amazing. I imagine it would have uh, caused quite a few headaches, especially growing up and doing things like fire juggling for your parents, for example. <laughs> they, uh, they, they took a minute to sign on, but uh, eventually I think they recognized I had potential and ended up supporting me through my journey, which is really nice. But uh, there was definitely a few angry, uh, angry evenings where um, fire, fire performing in the backyard was, was frowned upon. Um, doing backflips off the sofa was frowned upon, uh, <laughs> stuff like this. So um, I was lucky. Um, some people might... Uh, be immensely terrified at the idea that their son's going to run away and join the circus but i think especially now with the advent of social media and everything people can see into the lives of high level elite athletes that are in Cirque du Soleil and you don't necessarily even have to be an elite athlete if you're just like a good showman or a good performer um, it's more and more respected uh, particularly in european countries and and in uh, west or eastern canada in Quebec, but uh, more, more so in the West now, it's being recognized as, you know, with everybody doing yoga and, and everything and looking after their bodies, it's really, people recognize that, oh, wow, actually that takes a lot of work and discipline. And it's not just like it used to be, if you join the circus, you're a carny and you, you couldn't make it as a doctor or something, but uh, it's, it's really hard work and uh, you have to be on top of yourself. So it's, it's getting more respect as a career. Totally. And that's a great springboard into my next question here. Being an, an elite athlete, what does the day-to-day -day look like for you? So the day-to-day, -day, uh, there, there's, there's a, a bunch of stuff that you have to take into account. And I wrote some of this down. There's like several, it's not just one thing. You have to, being a performer and an elite athlete, you have to look, um, you have to look after yourself physically, but also emotionally and uh, um, financially, and you need to be prepared because it's not just uh, performing. So you gotta take care of your bodies the first thing. So uh, you, that means you can't go crazy with partying. Um, alcohol has to be in moderation. Um, you don't want to be eating garbage all the time. Sleep is very important. 
Um, and, and some of these things that can take a toll on your physical health, um, they can take it, they can take a toll on your mental health <clears throat> in the, uh, in the sense that like your, your brain will slow down. And then when you're doing a double backflip through the air, there's every, the real possibility you can become gravely injured, not because your body isn't up to it, but because your brain is slower. So you really want to be on your A game for as much as possible. Now, that being said, it is show business. So there's all kinds of, uh, festivals and parties and events and, and, and galas and things like that. And it just, that's a challenge for a lot of people. Hollywood is the same way. Like there's a certain expectation that you have to behave at, but you're surrounded by a lot of people that are in the industry that are not the performers, they're the producers or, or they're retired or whatever. And then those guys party crazy. So you have to really take a step back and be like, okay, I need to take care of myself first and resist the temptation that comes with show business. So that's the first thing, take care of your body. The second thing day to day is training. So even if you get up and you, you feel like crap and you can't, uh, you can't get out of bed, you know, you need to do it anyways, because the most important thing is to do it every day. It doesn't matter if you're not on your A game every day, but the difference between the people that make it to the Olympics or to Cirque du Soleil and stuff like that is, is that they got up and they went to training anyways. So just a, a sense of discipline and commitment to the, the training. And, you know, nine times out of 10, <clears throat> excuse me, nine times out of 10, if you get to, to the gym and you have a good workout, you feel good afterwards, even if, you, if it's hard to get there. So it's, it's really like there's a, a hashtag that's out there for the, uh, the circus community. Um, it's hashtag circus every damn day. And that uh, that's just goes to show, like, even if you don't like it, let's go do it every day. Uh, the next part of the day today is uh, prospecting. So it's an, it's one thing to be a talented and, and good at your craft, but uh, you need to go look for work. So it's very, it's a unique, well, uh, it's not unique. There's a lot of other um, career paths that have this aspect, but you need to go and look for contracts. You need to look for gigs. You need to audition for shows. Um, and in some cases, produce your own if there's none available. So some of your day, I usually try and spend at least an hour a day on the internet looking in other countries what productions are going on um what what sort of uh festivals are coming up who's who's got money you know like if uh if there's especially in calgary if there's like a an oil uh, executives that they're they're setting up for a christmas party you need to know that because that's where a good uh, uh money making opportunity comes from so always be looking looking for agents looking for deals that's that's what i call prospecting and you should uh in addition to being good at your craft, you need to always be looking for opportunities just because no one's going to call you up. Well, sometimes people call you up, but most of the time you need to be putting yourself out there and then uh, preparing. So we had prospecting now preparing. So preparing isn't training. Preparing is more like, uh, let's say I have a three month contract in Saudi Arabia and it starts in two months. So now I have to go and learn what's the culture like in Saudi Arabia. I have to learn a little bit of Arabic. I have to prepare my apartment, who's going to take care of my dog, et cetera, like that. There's a lot of um, travel based, um, uh, uh, a lot of the circus and performing arts careers travel based, especially if you want to go uh, to higher levels. And uh, that means that you need to be comfortable with uh, lifting up and, and going to different places and being prepared for that. Like, you know, do you need your shots? just that kind of kind of aspect and uh so that would be preparing preparing then the the one that we all know about performing so performing is the best part easily like being on stage being um there in the light and 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 putting your best self forward and having the uh, audience applaud that that's that's really cool so that's that's why we do it but that's only a small part of being a performer and uh that's not to discount it. You definitely need to put all the other things, the prospecting, the preparing, the training, everything, it all leads up to the performance. But um, yeah, that, that's, uh, it's, it's the best part, but it's also one of the smaller parts. It, uh, that sounds very rewarding. And also like, it's a lot of hard work. Um, it sounds like you've really put a lot of hard work into your craft. Um, yeah. Just like a, a, a painter needs to spend hours in the studio to get that finished product. When you, uh, when you do perform, it is the culmination of all of your your efforts, and it's it's very satisfying if you if you do well, and it can be totally crushing if you make a mistake and fall on stage or make a make an error in front of thousands of people. But uh, once you spend a little bit of time um, failing, like it's really important in in performance to be okay with failure. 
Like when you're training something, you're going to fall 10, 20, 30 times before you get it. And uh, even when your failures are macro in scope. So one time I, I was performing for the 2015 Pan Am Games and there was a uh, live stream footage and um, live television show of our performance in downtown Toronto. And I totally biffed it on stage. And I just was, you know, I had to keep going. You can't stop and reduce your levels of energy and positivity. You need to keep giving the show must go on. And that kind of stuff happens. And performers that know other performers are like, oh, dude, you fell at the Pan Am Games. Oh, I fell in front of uh, the president. You know, like <laughs> it's, it's, it, it becomes funny. In the moment, it's mortifying, but it, it's something that you come to terms with. It's, there's always going to be, there's no such thing as a perfect show. There's costume malfunctions. Things can go wrong with your lighting, your sound equipment, weather, et cetera. So it's, you just take it on the chin and that's part of uh, being a good performer. Awesome. Uh, so you touched on this a little bit, um, but what type of training or schooling did you do in order to start performing cir in circus? Um, it was, for me, it was a bit of a long road. So I started, like I mentioned, doing martial artists or martial arts, um, Taekwondo and uh, some other martial arts. And th that prepared my body for um, sort of training and stuff. And a lot of other people might have backgrounds in dance or figure skating or blah, blah, blah. Um, it's good to have physical literacy. So physical literacy is basically like literacy, literacy, but for your body, if you're, if you're really, if you're a, a tennis player of, of 20 years and you, you have an, a very good understanding of your body, if you have to go learn how to play hockey, it's going to take you less time than if starting from the scratch. So the same thing with, uh, with circus, if you want to learn to be an expert um, trapeze acrobat and you can already do some martial arts or some uh, horseback riding or something you understand how your body moves that's that's really important so that's a good place to start it's not necessary you can start from the ground up and what I did was I did uh, martial arts and I went into a conservatory to learn musicality singing acting dancing professionalism in the arts that kind of deal and uh, then uh, there are so around the world um, a number of uh, professional circus colleges um, and this is where you got to tell your parents. It's not clown college. That's very different. Um, it's a circus uh, institution with the finest coaches and uh, ex-Olympic gymnasts, ex-Cirque uh, du Soleil acrobats, all teaching there. And uh, you can go there and do a variety of programs. Sometimes it's a one-year um, program. Sometimes it's a four-year residency. The National Circus School in uh, Montreal is where I went, and I did a, a three-year um, DEC college program. So you do get a college diploma at the end of it. We studied uh, eight hours a day in the studio and three hours a day in the classroom. So that would be uh, things like philosophy, English, French language, um, anatomy, uh, pro professionalism in the arts, lighting, that kind of stuff. That would be in the classroom and then eight hours in the studio. So when you were, I had a major in sear wheel, which is a, uh, a giant metal hula hoop that you stand inside, you spin around. I got a, a little model of one here. Um, my girlfriend made this for me as a Christmas ornament, but it's, it's kind of like, uh, so you spin around in, in the circle like this. It's on the floor, not on the ground. Uh, so that was my major, my minor was in trampoline. And uh, just like any other college, you get a major and a minor, but you're also, when you're going to circus school, you're learning um, a thousand other things at, at once. So you're learning uh, how to stretch properly, how to work out properly, how to eat properly. Um, how to do acrobatics. Juggling was mandatory. We had to do a juggling uh, course. And I'll just do a, a touch uh, quickly on juggling. If you want to prepare for anything in your life, you should learn to juggle. And the reason I say that is because juggling is one of those physical activities that connects your two hemispheres of your brain through cross synaptic firing. So because your right hand is dealing with your left and your left hand is dealing with your right, um, they did a study, uh, and I wish I could give references for this. It's kind of just me saying, so you'll have to believe me, but they did a study and um, if you juggle before uh, an exam or a test, um, you the, up to eight to 10% higher on scores they recorded. So just because your brain is, is cross-firing, very useful. You can do the same thing with like some different physical exercises, but learning to juggle is very healthy for your brain. But uh, moving on, yeah, so I, I did the, uh, the National Circus School program at, in Montreal. There are similar programs in Quebec City, um, Brussels, London, Australia. Um, there's some in uh, Germany. There's there's uh, definitely some crazy ones in Shanghai. Um, there's a lot of institutions worldwide that if you're serious and you want to do like a three-year 
uh, boot camp, so to say. Um, it's usually it's audition based. So you you audition to get in just like a lot of different art schools around the world. Um, but if you make the cuts, then you're there prepped for the best training that you can get in the world. And the more the most important part of going to these schools, the training is really good. Uh, it, that's that's the secondary part. The most important part is the networking. If you go to the National Circus School in Montreal, you meet everybody in Cirque du Soleil pretty much. Well, not everybody, but you meet a lot of people and um, it's, the, it's the people that you meet, the people that see you training, that's important for your career. So it's a really good move. It's not necessary, however, like if you have a really good uh, understanding of your craft, so many people have been discovered by Cirque du Soleil and uh, big um, companies like that through YouTube, through Instagram now. So there's platforms to be seen, but the networking and the training is really helpful. Plus you can actually go get a college degree that will transfer over later. So that's, that's a, a route you can do. Awesome. Um, that once again, ties in very well to my next question, which is how does someone get an, a job in the field? You talked about networking, you talked about, um, I believe prospecting, um, in your day to day, uh, would those be kind of the main ways in which you would get a job in this field? Uh, yes, um, there, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll be more specific though. So uh, the first and foremost would be to audition for a company. Now, big companies include um, uh, Cirque du Soleil, the most famous one, I would say. And then uh, there's other companies, uh, Le Cet de la Main, Cirque de Loise. These are Quebec companies that are uh, amazing to work for. There's also all kinds of uh, companies over in Europe and uh, in Asia as well. Um, so there's there's uh, lots of established companies that have annual or semi-annual productions and they're always casting and looking for new um, uh, new talent so what you would do is you'd either go to one of their auditions that they hold in a city and you know you would go there and you would take part in the audition which can be anywhere from one to like three days and uh, you go through a variety of stuff uh, dance um, exercises um, strength evaluations flexibility evaluations interviews and then you would show your material your, your act, your number. So it's really important to have uh, several of your own acts. If you just have all these, a miscellaneous bag of talents and you just keep them, that's really good. But you, you, you always want to have something that's show ready to just whip out of your pocket and be like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to audition with this kind of like if you're trying to be an actor or a musician and you have a set list or a couple of songs that you just are really good. Um, having prepared polished material is really important. And that leads me to the next uh, way that you can get a job. So you can get a job through, um, I've actually been approached by a lot of people through email or, or Instagram. They just see your social media content because you're posting cool videos and stuff. And they're like, hey, listen, you're, you look really neat. You're the type of person we're looking for. How would you feel about starting to move on to negotiations? And uh, that's another way. So you can get noticed that way. I've been picked up a few times off the street. So I was doing uh, street shows on Stephen Avenue Mall. And some producer was just having lunch and he was like, wow, actually, we're doing something next weekend. Are you available? Um, so that's that's another way you can do it. Now, another way you can get noticed and get a lot of jobs is through festivals. So festivals are they are gatherings the same way that you'd have a music festival. Um, there's circus festivals around the world. And they sell tickets to the general public so you can come in and see the festival. But the, the programming, uh, the programmation, is that an English word? Um, the, uh, the programming of the festival um, is a bunch of different acts from all over the world that are, are either new and upcoming or interesting and unique. And it's a, it's a great way for producers, directors to see you. And there's also a lot of competition. So, uh, um, for example, the top three acts will compete for cash prizes or medals or it's very prestigious. The most famous and uh, the most prestigious uh, circus festival in the world is the uh, uh, Festival Mondial de Cirque de Demain in Paris, which translates to the Circus Festival of Tomorrow. They're the World Circus Festival of Tomorrow. And basically it's the Circus Olympics. So there's gold, uh, silver and bronze and a wide array of uh, supplementary prizes. The top acts that have been curated for that year in the world um, all compete and a, a panel of expert judges. It's, it's very cool. It's nice. It's live streamed every year. So we all have a, a viewing party. Um, but that's another good way, to, good, good thing to aim for. Like if you wanted to get noticed by everywhere, everyone um, and, and pick up the best jobs that you can pick up in the industry, 
these festivals are a really good thing to shoot for. And the people you meet is, is, is outstanding too. So, so far we have big companies, we have uh, social media or getting noticed by uh, scouts, and then you have festivals. So those are three big uh, ways to get jobs. The fourth and um, arguably the most reliable is get an agent. So there's a lot of uh, entertainment agencies that will go to, um, or that big corporate interests will go to. So like the, the doctors of Saskatchewan's club has an annual um, uh, get together with cocktails and has entertainment. Let's just say this is hypothetical. And then they would then go to an entertainment agency in uh, Saskatchewan and be like, okay, we're looking for entertainment. Do you have magicians? Do you have bands? Do you have DJs? And do you have circus performers? And if you can get yourself an agent um, that has all of your material and while you're sleeping is looking for uh, deals for you, that's a really good way to make money. And uh, sometimes they'll, actually most of the time, they'll charge a fee. So like a 15% fee is pretty industry standard. Um, if your agent's charging you 35%, get a new agent. Um, but uh, for the most part, there's agencies that will look for gigs for you. And uh, that's, so that's the fourth way. And then I had the fifth way is, uh, it's part of prospecting. It's just, I'll just add it now. And then that's go international. We're at a point in the world where um, A, the, uh, the local community is often too small. Uh, there's probably too many people competing for too few jobs. And if you go, if you go international, if you're, if you got a good passport up and you're okay with traveling and it's something you're okay doing, you can uh, be very, very successful. And, um, you know, there's nothing going on in Calgary this weekend, but there's three things in Germany and two things in Singapore. So see you later. Um, and a lot of times, depending on which level you're performing at, companies will pay for your flights and accommodations. And um, you just have to be okay with the, uh, new experience of traveling. And uh, if you pick up a few extra languages under your wing, that's also super recommended. French is a good one. Um, Mandarin, Russian, German, all great languages to learn for circus. Wow, that's uh, quite a few ways to get a job. Um, it sounds like you travel quite a bit as well. What are some of the challenges that you face while uh, performing for circus? Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, challenges. So like I mentioned before, you're not just working for a company who's all, or you're not always working for a company that is is paying you regularly. You have to go out and find gigs, and uh, circus and performing arts in general is kind of a feast or famine um, industry. In that, what that means is that it's either going really good for you, and you're getting lots of money, uh, and you're working a lot, and you you know you got to make make sure you don't burn out, or there's nothing. It's dead. Now we're blessed with this wonderful time of COVID-19 and there is, there is very much nothing. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been fortunate. I've got a few projects here and there, but a lot of the times you just have to make sure you save well, because there will be times where you're like, man, there's, it's dry. There's no, there's no performances. And, um, uh, oh, I actually, I, I, I should have touched on this when we talked about ways to make money. So I was mostly focusing on the performing aspect, but there's three main um, aspects of being a circus person that, uh, that you need to, uh, I'll, I'll answer the question about the troubles, but I just like to go back to, to ways to make money here. Uh, you have performing and that's basically both, uh, let's try that again, performing. That's basically what I've touched on so far, but there's creating, performing and teaching. So if there's no work for performance, you can end up teaching or you can end up creating. And when I say creating, I mean directing shows, writing, um, writing material, uh, creating new costumes, creating new um, movements or, or tricks or apparatuses to, to do your thing. It doesn't necessarily always need to be a performance. So if there's nothing, if there's no performance or even to make your performance better, you can you focus on directing, producing, that kind of deal, and then teaching. So a lot of the times when I don't have anything uh, on the scope for traveling big performance gigs, I will teach. I teach uh, sear wheel, acrobatics, some handstands. Um, I teach uh, hip hop dance now, and uh, just a lot of different stuff that I'm doing that is, um, it, it's easy for me to do at home, or if there's a circus school, a local circus school, you can go in, teach a workshop, um, you know, like a couple weekends or just a short term intensive on whatever uh, discipline that you happen to special in, specialize in. And that's, that's a really good way to um, supplement your, your income as a, as a performer, because you're not always going to be on the road touring. There's downtime and you need downtime sometimes too, if you want to take a break from the road and 
stay in one place for a while, a couple months teaching can be really good for your mental health. So that brings me back to some of the, um, the troubles. So finding gigs can be a bit of a problem uh, sometimes. So you got to make sure that you can teach or have you have another job or interest that you can do. Passive income is really good to focus on um, if, you're, if you're a performer as well. And uh, then another trouble would be negotiation. So this is true of all shows, show business. Um, show business is a, a rough and tumble ride. And you need to, if you don't have an agent that's very good at dealing with um, clients on your behalf, uh, you need to sort of become comfortable with a little bit of the business aspect of the deal. So knowing what you're worth is really important. A very big problem in the circus industry is that someone will be new to the industry and they will accept gigs for not a lot of money far below the industry standard like 80 bucks for a night for example um and they're either they're in, they're young and inexperienced so they're like oh this is this is great i get experience you know or or the worst one the one that makes me just so mad is exposure uh there's no uh there's no there's no money in this gig but it'll be good exposure like uh, yeah, just it turns out that um, I asked my landlady uh, if she'd accept exposure for my rent this month. It turns out she won't. So um, n try never to accept gigs for exposure. Always at least some sort of honorarium or um, or some sort of fee just to let it that everyone in the industry know. No, I provide a service. I work for my craft. You wouldn't pay a painter to paint your house with exposure. The same thing goes for uh, performing arts. So being able to negotiate with clients. Um, if they offer you a number and the number's not good, how to talk to them politely and, uh, and, and respectfully, but still get your point across. That's, that's a learned skill. You can take many courses on that and you can read books and stuff, but it's really important if you're going to be a, especially a freelance, but uh, it's always good to know how to negotiate uh, contracts. You know, if, if never try never to accept a gig without a contract, that's sort of the industry standard. If you have a, uh, if you have verbal agreements that you're going to get paid X amount of money, and then all of a sudden, whoever's hired, this happened to me in Saudi Arabia not too long ago. Um, I didn't have a contract. I'd asked for one the entire time that I was there. So, hey, when's my contract ready? And um, the guy who hired me just kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And then finally, when everything was said and done, he's asked me to do all this extra work and go to two different cities and carry his baggage around the world and stuff. And uh, at that point I had no guarantee that he was going to pay me. So I didn't have a negotiating point to say, no, I'm not going to do that. You need to come back from Bali on vacation and pick up all your stuff that you left in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, you need to, you know, or uh, I wasn't in a position to argue with the guy because he could just be like, okay, well, I'll just not pay you till you do that. You know? So always, always being in a good negotiating position and putting things in writing is important. And that's, that has nothing to do with performing or dance or ballet or anything like that, but you need to have that uh, skill to be a performer, uh, I believe 100%. Now, another big problem that you can face in performing arts is injuries. And that's the toughest one for me. Um, I, I really hate getting injured, but I get injured like anyone else would get. In, athletes get injured, cooks get cuts on their hands. Uh, if you work with animals, you might get bit. It's just part of the, the, the job. So um, the best thing you can do is learn how to be injured. And that's not something you want to go out and practice doing, but um, don't be okay with downtime. You know, it, it's a, sometimes it's a mental struggle. You're like, oh God, my skills are slipping. I'm not making money. I feel useless, but you need to give yourself the, the right healing time. And, uh, you know, obviously if you've sprained your ankle, you don't want to be drinking alcohol or partying or anything like that, or even eating sugar actually is bad for your, uh, your recovery time. So having that sort of discipline to be like, nope, now we're going to chill, we're going to heal and, and, and don't rush your recovery. That's something that you need to learn too. So that's a challenge and uh, injuries happen. They will happen small time injuries like uh, stub toe and uh, that can affect your performance. Or, you know, one time I landed from a double backflip right on my neck and I, was lucky to not be paralyzed. So sometimes big things happen. Sometimes small things happen. Uh, there will always be risk in circus. In some other performing arts, the risks can be mitigated. But part of the appeal of circus is the risk. And there's never going to be a 100% safe circus act because that's what is interesting. That's the human element. You can create crazy animatronic robots that do the same stuff that we do. In fact, uh, Disney was looking into putting some of theirs um, robots in their shows, but the real appeal of 
circus and performing arts is the human risk. And so that's integral to it. And uh, taking the right risks, you know, don't try something new that you've never done on stage. Always take the proper safety equipment and in, during training. And, you know, if it's a big dangerous act like flying trapeze, have a net, you know, no one's going to fault you for not having net. It's 2020. Um, be safe. You don't want to ruin somebody's experience of circus forever by being the guy who gets injured on stage. So that's all I have to say about injuries. Just it, they happen and and deal with them appropriately, or they'll 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 be much more trouble than they, than they're worth. Now, the last challenge that I've, I have here on my list is uh, global issues, and that is, for example, uh, coronavirus, COVID nineteen. That has put our industry to a complete standstill. Um, it's it's ruined all of our lives basically, and you know that's just a big recent example. But uh, there was a while there where um, uh, you even traveling with uh, strange and unknown equipment um, on an airline, like uh, closer to around uh, the original September 11 attacks and uh, some of the other global uh, terrorism events and stuff, and going to certain countries, going to the United States, for example, uh, coming back to the United States from being in the Middle East, there are definite problems that you will encounter. And uh, I've, you know, I, I keep my equipment in a large, big box and there's weird looking pipes and stuff in there. Um, so uh, every time, every time I'm at the airport, I always get selected for a customs check and everything like that. And you just have to be uh, okay with that because when you're traveling borders or doing different kind of stuff, you need, there's, there, that's the reality of being a global international performer. Sometimes borders are closed. Sometimes uh, a country that you were in two weeks ago erupts into war or you know, uh, uh, I've had people that uh, were doing outreach uh, social circus projects in uh, Pakistan, um, and they had they were detained by uh, Israeli authorities for a long time. Like, why would you want to go to pa uh, Pakistan, or not uh, not Pakistan? Um, uh, pardon me, uh, um, Palestine, Palestine. Pardon me. Um, uh, going to Palestine from 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 Israel to do uh, social circus. Uh, you, you get detained and people are like, well, why, why do you want to go to Palestine and, and stuff? Um, so there's, there's global conflicts that will get in your way. There's uh, uh, the threat of global terrorism that will get in your way. And um, you're very unique. The people that, that um, are in charge of security at borders and stuff, they see all kinds of people, but they, they don't often see circus performers. So usually they're pretty interested and you stand out, which is going to make you if even if they're just, you know, they don't think there's anything wrong with you, they've just been sitting at their desk all day and they want to talk to you because they're bored of, of checking everybody's bag. They're like, oh, what you got here? You know, it, it's part of it. So just be very patient when you're when you're crossing borders. Don't uh, don't do anything dumb like pack dumb stuff in your in your um, in your baggage. Don't don't play with the rules about uh, borders and and import export stuff because you're gonna get they're gonna be interested in you. So. <laughs> Just keep your keep your P's and Q's, like mind your manners and, and play by the line and you should be okay. But that is, that is a, an issue. And um, the, the, the last part I'll touch on that is cultural differences. Uh, Cirque du Soleil has been involved in a lot of uh, work in the Middle East very, very recently. Um, the, the, there, there was this large production in Saudi Arabia not too long ago. And uh, it was the king of Saudi Arabia or the prince of Saudi Arabia that invited them to do this giant production but they're very culturally different and so they would say that um like men and women can't perform on stage together and if you're a, a female performer that you might be used to wearing like a bodysuit or some sort of costume like that well over in Saudi Arabia you have to cover up all of your skin and stuff so you just need to be aware of the cultural realities wherever you are um or indeed uh the content of your shows based on global uh events like it would be you know in poor taste to, to do certain um certain performances about certain stuff if the headlines in the news have just been um a, a terrible event and part of your show touches on that in a, in a way that might be considered crass you, you yeah you, you always have to be looking over your shoulder because as a performance performing as someone who does performance in the 20 21st century everyone's seeing it on facebook people will comment and someone's going to get offended so this is another another point. People will not like what you do. Just take it on the chin. You can't please everybody as long as you do your best and you you got your best intentions. There's always going to be one group that didn't like it, and uh, 
you know, always try and be respectful. Don't try and offend anybody on purpose, but um, it, it will happen. Somebody's going to comment on the Facebook and be like, this sucks. This made me angry. And you can't, you can't make everyone happy, but I think that's all I have here for issues. So yeah. Awesome. Uh, haters are going to hate. All right. <laughs> um, do you have any advice or tips for youth who are interested in getting into circus? I absolutely do. I have a lot of a lot of tips. So um, a little bit of this is a, 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 a kind of a summary of what I said before. But uh, the first tip is be clean. So uh, don't, uh, you know, don't eat junk food, don't stay up late doing all kinds of stuff. Definitely don't, uh, don't find yourself tempted by drugs or alcohol, like, you know, a, little, a drink now and then is okay. Um, but try not to endanger your physical or mental health, um, just because of the level that you need to be uh, a, the level that you need to be at mentally and physically is very high. And B, like I mentioned before, if you're internationally traveling around and there's, for example, in Saudi Arabia, alcohol is illegal. So don't bring it in your suitcase, that kind of stuff. Just be, be aware, be clean, and then you'll, you'll have no problems. The second, the second piece of advice, start now. Um, practice. It's never too late to start. There's, uh, I did a show in uh, Toronto uh, two years in a row. Uh, it was about 19, it was, you know, 19 shows a week or 18 shows a week. It was three shows a day, 40 minute shows. And uh, there, was, uh, there was one day where there was four shows a day. And it was, it, was, it was really rough and it was high level circus and we performed a lot. I was 25, 26 um, when I was doing the, the, the run of the shows. Some of the other acrobats were around the 30 mark, but there was a couple from Portugal and they did two acts in the show and they did high level um, uh, uh, rollabola, which is like, a, like a, a plastic tube with a board on it, but he would stack the plastic tubes up like six high and be doing handstands on them and doing crazy stuff. And then his wife and him would go in a, on a roller diamond table. So if you can imagine a, a coffee table sized round table with a slight divot to the center and two people on roller skates can now circle each other because of the, the way the table is shaped and do tricks on that tiny little space. Well, they would do three, sometimes four shows a day and they were both 50 years old. So there's uh, the, the, I think the oldest con Mongolian contortionist was like 65 or something like that. The point is it's never too late and start now, or if you know, you, you'll always regret be like, oh, I wish I started sooner. Start now. It doesn't matter. Like you can start juggling, you can start doing ballet, but, but uh, uh, don't, don't waste any time. It's, it, it's never too late. Get, get going and practice. So that's the next tip is talent is practice in disguise. You know, talent is like 10% of it. Like, yeah. Okay. Maybe you're like, have an affinity for a certain type of movement or activity, but the, to get anywhere, you just need to practice, 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 practice. And then when you're tired and you're crying and you don't want to practice anymore, practice again, because talent, yeah, talent is practice in disguise. That's, there's really no getting around that. You need to, you need to work at it. And it's just like anything. If you want to be a doctor, you got to go through years and years of school. Uh, if you want to be a performer, you got to go through years and years of training and fail, fail often and be okay with failure because there's no way you're going to land that perfect backflip to one foot catch all the time. Like there's going to be days, good days, bad days, but be okay with uh, making mistakes and learning and growing. That's like the biggest, the biggest point I could make, but I have a few more. So uh, travel, get to know people. Um, if you're, if you're traveling and you you've been to other cities, you've been to other theaters, you've been to other cultures, your scope of what you can draw on artistically and logistically are much, much bigger. So, you know, there's tons and tons of people that are doing the same thing that you're doing all across the world. And if you can meet those people and collaborate and become a global community, you're much, much stronger and you're much, much more uh, connected. There's, there's more opportunities, you know, and, and if you can speak a couple extra languages, I said this again, um, learn, learn at least a second language and then get to know the people in that in that speak those languages that are doing the same activity or discipline as you because you know the 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 the, the community for steer wheel this thing that i do um what it, it started very small there was only a couple of hundred people worldwide that were doing it and since 2000 uh i started in 2010 so here we are uh, 11 years later and there's there's probably 10,000 people worldwide that do it huge 
Facebook groups and people are speaking different languages and it's just, it's really cool. And we're in a, we're in an age where everything is just going to explode more and more diverse and more people are going to do it with more languages and everything in the internet. So yeah, definitely travel, meet people, meet communities, diversify yourself, uh, unburden yourself. So this is a, a bit of a strange point. So uh, if you want to be a performer, you need to commit to performing and you need to commit to practice and everything. It's really tough to be like, do it as a hobby and get any traction. You can. Um, and if, it, you know, if just an occasional gig every couple months is, is what you're looking for, that's totally possible. But if you want to make it your career, um, you know, maybe don't get a mortgage and have to be somewhere in one part of the world forever and ever or, um, you know, settle down with a bunch of roots in a certain area, be light, be unburdened. If you have to just be like, oh, pack your suitcase, we're going to Saudi Arabia for two weeks. Um, the ability to do that and not have like a huge, uh, uh, like, you know, seven dogs that you have to get looked after and stuff. I love dogs, dogs are great. I wanna have a dog, but for, for me right now, it's not, uh, it's not in the cards. So try and be, you don't have to not have anything, but just be in, try and be in a position where if you need to leave, or you need to focus on something or you, you, you know, you don't have things tying you down. That's, uh, that's important. And uh, the, the last thing that I would say would be surround yourself with it. Total immersion, like um, watch circus movies, listen to sa soundtracks from circus shows. Um, you, you know, instead of, instead of spending your free time on the PlayStation, which I'm definitely guilty of sometimes, but uh, you know, pick up those juggling clubs and, and give it a whirl or, uh, learn a new discipline and, and, and read, a, read a book about it or stuff. The more you surround yourself with it, the more you let it permeate yourself and your soul, the more easy it's going to be to create and draw upon that power. And, um, you know, a little PlayStation now and then is all right, but just uh, make sure that you're not, uh, um, you, you're not really liking the world of performing in circus, but never really putting your toes in the water, so to speak. If you want to dive in, dive in. Awesome. Uh, those are all great tips. Um, I actually tell my youth the same thing when I teach the math. Uh, practice. That's all it takes is practice. Um, yeah. And I think that's true with a lot of things. Uh, if the youth wanted to catch any of your shows, are you doing anything in Alberta um, post-pandemic? Um, actually, uh, very much uh, during the pandemic. We've just, create, we've just filmed a movie. Um, it's an online show. It's called 10. And uh, I'll just pull up the uh, the link here. I'll send you actually. I'll send you the link afterwards if you want to help. Uh, yep, uh, I'll just put it in the comments or the credits. Excellent. So it's a little bit. Uh, it, it it it's probably for older uh, older kids and uh, for parents and stuff. It's not very. It's not a a show made with uh, with 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 children in mind. There, there's some very. Um, uh, there, there's some more adult concepts in it. It deals with a lot of uh, how people have been feeling in this pandemic lately. So a lot of um, anguish and, and mental uh, um, mental health issues and stuff like that. But uh, we worked very hard on this project and uh, um, we're, we're selling tickets for the virtual shows. Uh, they'll be released the next four weekends. So this uh, coming weekend is the premiere weekend. And um, if there's, uh, you know, art aficionados among you or it, it's worth a look, uh, following that, um, we're the this company here. So the Cirque de la Nuit is um, uh, Alberta's premier like nightlife circus, and now it's branching into the theatrical performances. So we're coming out with a, um, a production of uh, uh, an Alice in Wonderland based production called Wondrous, and that's in the works for some time in the spring. I'll have more on that um, at a later time. But uh, we we did perform that show at the Palace theater in, uh, downtown and, and it sold out around the block and it was a huge success. So we're transferring it to a COVID safe theater environment instead of a, a party at the palace. So, uh, and then post pandemic, we're definitely looking at doing some more, um, some more shows with the Cirque de la Nuit and uh, be on the lookout for the new Cirque du Soleil productions too. And uh, Cirque de la Oise. things are going to be picking up um, as soon as we're allowed, <laughs> allowed to have it. But uh, yeah, for the meantime, there's there's that show 10 that I talked about, which is what I've been working on mostly. Uh, um, there's there's an, another couple of places you can look, uh, uh, you know, obviously social media, Vimeo, um, Instagram, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, my uh, my Instagram and, and YouTube stuff is just justin.dale.performance. And that uh, that goes to show a little bit of what I do. 
Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of uh, good specials on YouTube right now that Cirque du Soleil has put out. They've put out these 60 minute specials that look in depth um, at some of their shows and uh, interviews with performers and stuff like that. So that's a good place to get a little bit of that one wow factor since we can't really go to shows right now. Um, but there's there's tons of online resources as well. Um, there a lot of them are in French, but uh, there's there's a, a fair amount of online resources from uh, social media that you can definitely a quick search will bring up oodles and oodles of um, of performance and people's just people's demo reels, you know, artists that are trying to get hired at like or their websites and stuff. That's always a good thing to take a look at, sort of see how things are are done in the industry that way. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Justin. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, if any of you youth have any questions for Justin, uh, feel free to submit that on our website. Uh, and then I will forward them to Justin and we'd be happy to send you an answer back. Or if we have an overwhelming number of questions, we might schedule another Zoom session if that's okay with you. Um, Absolutely. Otherwise, we're going to be posting videos throughout the week. Uh, so stay tuned. We've got lots of interesting careers coming up. Uh, thank you for signing on. Cheers.